just, uh, so this is our second uh, DDCAN 2.0 call. Um, this is uh, February 13th. So who would like to check in? I would like to check in. Great, Jim. <laughs> okay. Um, so my check-in is my book of the month. Uh, yeah. And I, uh, Linda, I sent you the table of contents. And uh, I don't know how we can uh, share it with others. Um, well, what I could do, why don't you, why don't you uh, keep going for your check-in and I'll try to bring it up on the, on the screen. Yeah. So um, uh, the book is called Wicked and Wise. And a um, hundred pages of it is uh, about climate change. And uh, there's a, a particularly interesting part of a chapter on uh, facilitating uh, in this, this manner. So Wicked and Wise, How to Solve the World's Toughest Problems. That sounds good. And the authors are Watkins, Allen, and Ken Wilber. So we might have some Ken Wilber fans in the audience here. Um, and uh, basically, the book's about um, <clears throat> describing what a, a wicked problem is, and that is multi-dimensional, multi-stakeholders, multi-causes, symptoms, and solutions, and constantly evolving. So that certainly uh, uh, identifies climate change. They develop their methodology in about 60 pages, and then they spend 100 pages on climate change. And uh, so the idea, and then with the, uh, the plea for facilitators who are um, integrally coherent, trained in integral coherence, uh, an integrally consistent, faci coherent facilitator uh, who uh, make all this work because there's a lot of stakeholder work and there's, oh, hi. <laughs> uh, and so anyhow, that's, that's, there we go, that's that now. So we, we have the, uh, fabulous, we, we have, <clears throat> we have the, uh, table of contents, the first page, and, uh, next page is, You want the next page up? Yeah. There. So, uh, for folks who are, <clears throat> this is a blending then of um, uh, Ken Wilber's integral framework and Alan Watkins' notion of coherence. That's. I know that's, Alan. What? I was wondering if it were Alan from yeah. the UK. I, I know Alan really well. He's been here. We brought him here to Tampa Bay. Great. You did? Yeah. What kind of guy is he? He's a great guy. Tell him hello. Okay. So anyhow, um, so we have the uh, part three then is after uh, describing the uh, method, part three then is the application to climate change. And uh, then uh, part four is how to uh, find a solution. And it involves a lot, a lot of uh, process work. So that's the applicability. Right. And I'm just then identifying this and then I'll let someone else check in. So you can talk, you can walk us through this a little bit later? Yeah, sure. Well, keep, keep going. Tell us more what, what you're up to um, before you uh, stop. I'll stop the share here. Okay, what I'm up to. So, remember, I'm working with a faith-based organization, the Unitarian Church in Exeter, New Hampshire, and uh, we have an active hope group, and we're using Joanna Macy's uh, process in that group, and we've been meeting now for, well, well over several years. And we're feeling, that, uh, at least I'm feeling, uh, that we're, we're 
need to broaden our, our focus and uh, all the way to the political scene. And that is, ties in with Marty's comment about um, bridging the divide. Uh, but we're going to talk about that Thursday. And uh, let's see, what else? We had a, um, a very strong presence in the Women's March in Washington, Boston, and Concord, New Hampshire. So that's my check-in. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Okay. I sure enjoy. Glad you made it. So we're just checking in and we're trying to sort to see if there's any um, kind of question that might arise from our check-ins. So who would like to go next? Was Jim the first? Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, this is Marty. I'll I'll go next. I don't know how coherent an overall check-in I'll have, but I I want to go now because um, I'm reading a book that um, is really stimulating my thinking, and it's this new book. This is an uprising. Have people heard of? This book, this is an uprising. It's a, it's a really good, very contemporary look at nonviolent social change, um, which you know involves direct action and has a different assumption base than probably. Although I think Ken Wilber has some of the action assumptions. But this is really a book based on power and where we get power from and how we exercise power to make change. And it's covering all the great social movements, um, you know, from and what we've learned from um, Gandhi and King, you know, familiar territory to many of us that have tried to see our work in progressive work and facilitating positive social change. Um, this, is, this is very stimulating for me because um, it, it's applying certain key principles um, to contemporary movements like the AIDS ACT UP movement and Occupy and hasn't really got to, to climate change that much directly. But th that's obviously what I'm thinking about when I'm reading the book. And I'll just share one concept that I'm thinking about a lot because most of my work bringing my facilitative leadership as well as my activism has been in Citizens Climate Lobby, which I think probably most of you know, focuses on a very specific policy solution. And it's, it's pretty far down the road in the sense that it's saying, gosh, if we had our heads screwed on straight, both Republicans and Democrats, conservatives, liberals, progressives, we all should be able to agree this is a really good solution. And in the book, and this will probably sound familiar to all of you, you know, he, ref he refers to, um, or they refer to, approaches like this as transactional change. You know, it's where you, re it's really in a small field. Um, you're not questioning any of the larger assumptions about how the society is structured or, or what's going on. And it's oftentimes in larger social movements, you don't get to those transactional changes until after you've done a lot more organizing and a lot more work. And then the juxtaposition to transactional change is transformational change, which carries with it a larger vision of the world that we're trying to create. And when you're focusing on transactional change, you are focusing very specifically on the power brokers that could give you what you want. So Citizens Climate Lobby focuses on electeds, you know, the members of Congress, and we are, it's increasingly gotten more sophisticated around trying to get other people putting pressure on them. But in transformational work, which I think is where a lot of the climate movement is, you're really trying to enlarge the movement. Your whole role isn't yet to go to the power brokers. You're trying to build up your own power for a more substantial vision of change you want. And so your actions and marches and any of the myriad of actions that you might take are really to be measured by how much you're raising public awareness and generating more public will. So I just, for me, because I'm going through a little bit of a walk in the wilderness with, 
where I want to put my climate energies. This book is very stimulating to me, and this is just one example, um, because um, I, I feel I will always support what Citizens Climate Lobby does, but whether it's the best place that I need to be right now doing um, the work that I think needs to be done, at this late state in the game, I mean, I think we often all forget just how urgent it is now, and maybe 10 years ago, the citizens' climate solution, climate lobby solution, would have been incredibly helpful towards solving a huge chunk of it. Now it's still now, a very now it's now it's but but oh I hear an echo oh, now. I hear an echo now. I'm sorry. I'm hearing an I'm echo, hearing echo now. now. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm going to put everybody on mute other than yourself. So uh, let's see if that'll. Uh, let's see. Well, I'll do it. Let's see. I, I, I got, got it. it. We got can it. do it. I got it. Oh. Okay. So, okay. So I'll wrap up quick here. Um, and I just lost my thread on that. Um, I know. The, the fact is, I'm very, I'm feeling a tremendous urgency. Um, and, and so that's my little walk in the wilderness, um, with the Trump administration coming in being such a push in the wrong direction. And yet the clock never stops ticking. I'm just rethinking what are the roles we play and how do we use the kind of skills we bring in, uh, in acting for the climate to, um, put myself where I can have the, be of the greatest service. That's, that's what I'm thinking about right now. Great, that's great. Yeah. Um, what was the author's name, Marty? This is an uprising, and it's by Mark Angler and Paul Angler. Thanks. Um, I really Thanks. highly recommend it. The subtitle is "How Nonviolent Revolt Is Shaping the Twenty First Century." That's great. Jim, just very briefly, can you tell me the author again of Wicked Problems, Deedwise Answers? <coughs> yes. It, well, it's uh, it's. Uh, Alan Watkins and Ken Wilbur. Great, thanks. Well, I guess I can go. Um, I don't really have much of a check-in um, myself. I feel, I feel very um, much kind of burnt out. Actually, I mean, I've been feeling that way ever since Trump, of course came into office, uh, I just go through my ups and downs and uh, ins and outs. I'm leaving tomorrow for a vacation. I'm coming up to Lake Tahoe to do a little bit of skiing and I'm really needing that. Um, just to get some perspective, I've been feeling kind of on a treadmill lately and not, not feeling like I've been terribly effective. Of course, not a lot is going on here. Um, I have to admit this uh, Tucson City Climate Change Committee I think I may have mentioned last time they're downsizing us. So that doesn't, you know, it hasn't really made me feel great. Um, and I don't like how they're doing it. They're not being terribly upfront with us. The um, city staff, oh, it's very political. I think in general what's happening is there's no money. But what they're doing though is they're putting pressure on us to be more forthcoming with work, but they're not approving our nominees. So we don't, we don't, we never have quorum anymore. Um, they're downsizing us uh, with another committee and they're trying to kind of control how it's done. So, you know, I'm missing a few meetings by being away and quite frankly, I just don't care. I mean, I'm going to see if I even want to be on it, you know, after I get back. So that's one thing I'm looking at possibly just getting off because it has been a very ineffectual year that I've been on the committee. I've I've tried to get some things going um, with my, you know, with my facilitator skills in a couple of different ways, but nothing ever seems to want to happen. The two um, co-leaders, one of them is getting off the committee because his um, tenure is, is over. The other one is always busy or getting married and um, has actually blocked action, I think, because he's felt blocked. He's a university professor of sustainability. He's felt incredibly blocked politically at U of A. And I think he's just feeling that he can't be effectual on this committee either. So I'm just going to see how it shakes out. So that's one area I've been uh, kind of, you know, just distancing from. The one uh, thing that I spend a lot of time on continually is this Architecture 2030 
and I, I'm enjoying it. It's kind of, I, I like the people on the committee. Um, Mark, you don't know about this, I don't think. Uh, it's an, it started out in Seattle, and there's maybe 11 such districts now that are little, you know, um, mirrors of what they did in Seattle. So what it is, Architecture District 2030, uh, they take a downtown area within an urban area, bound it, and then they invite building owners to join. And they pull resources, they, um, we benchmark their buildings. Just by benchmarking, they found that they can become more energy efficient. And there's a real business case now to make buildings energy efficient. So everything I keep reading and thinking about says if businesses don't jump on board to reducing carbon footprints, it's over. But they seem to be doing it. And it has nothing to do with the EPA. Well, well although this is really funny, we just barely squeaked by getting a class approved that's EPA driven through our local community college. In fact, that's where I am. Right after this call, I go into a class that the EPA is sponsored along with um, Architecture 2030. And this is a class that will go through May. It's once a week, two and a half hours. I can't believe I'm doing this. So I am learning about the ins and outs of energy efficiency in buildings. <laughs> oh. um, so I don't know. It's what I'm doing, and it seems to be working. I mean, it's one thing I can do, you know, and the, the irony also is that I used to be in real estate. My dad was, um, you know, a real estate guy, and I inherited properties, and I have two apartment complexes in Tucson, so they gave me half price because I'm a building owner, so I have <laughs> other reasons to even be in the course, you know, to learn how to be more energy efficient in my life. The other thing I'm doing, um, I started a dialogue group in my two-back community. This is the artist village where I live. It's called the Two-Back Community Forum. And very much like what I'm doing through NCDD with that, uh, the impact you know, of, of the post-election on the field, we keep driving down to the fact that we have this political divide, which is why I, I started with that question to you all. It seems like these two dialogues, my face-to-face -face group and then the one I'm doing on NCDD, um, it all boils down to how do we invite conservatives to join the conversation? We can't even get them there. And those of us who are facilitators are finally waking up to the fact that we've never known how to get conservative people or people with very conservative opinions to join in with us. So I'm just, um, I'm, I guess I'm taking a step back from urgent climate change work, which is where I was the last two years, to realizing that Maybe my work is simply really learning how to bridge the divide in how I facilitate and how I invite people into the conversation. And in the meantime, I'm doing this very practical energy efficiency thing. I'm even getting bids to put solar on my own house. And I'm going to look at getting an electric based vehicle because that way I can plug in to my solar unit at night, charge up my car and go in between, you know, Tucson and two back. And I'm, you know, I'm just, that's what I'm doing. So I'm kind of, you know, changing my priorities right now. That, oh, oh, and the one book that I'm reading, well, actually I'm reading several books um, that are related in odd ways. I'm finally reading that Hillbilly Elegy. I think, Marty, you and I had talked about that book and I'm loving it. It's really giving me some um, basic principles of, you know, what it's like to be from a very different orientation. Um, I, of course, am reading, I'm trying to get through Scott Wagner, he's on my NCDD dialogue. Um, he wrote a book called The Liberal's Guide to uh, Conservatives, and I, it's a great book. I wish I had read it before I did that session in NCDD, but oh well, I'm finally reading it now. And there's another book, um, let's see, it's Liberals, it's, it's written by the guy who started uh, Drinking Liberally, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to remember it. I, I can put it on our resource site. Uh, it's another book about how do you, how do liberals better support the conservatives. Then I'm reading this really neat book called uh, Viking Economics. Have, have any of you heard that? Okay, so I am loving this book. Yeah, <laughs> not very far into it, but I'm really loving it. Um, and then the other book I'm reading that was recommended by Barbara um, Simonetti, I may have mentioned it last time, uh, it's like brand new, The Brand New Strategy. And uh, it, it's quite related to what our work is because it's, it's saying that America, if we finally, you know, figure out a more um, purposeful direction than where we seem to be heading, uh, we should be leading this whole sustainability uh, 
um, trend in the world. I mean, that should be our rightful position. And I think we'll eventually get there. I mean, I hope we will. So that's me. Well, I'll, I'll go next. Um, I'm, uh, this is my first time in this group. So I think I know um, Joy and uh, Eleanor from uh, other Linda from other environments. So um, that's mainly with Tom Atley. So I, I live in Canberra, Australia. Um, maybe I should uh, start off with my book, if it sounds like everyone's sharing a book. I was going to mention uh, Viking Economics. I'm not actually reading it at the moment, but two people who I highly value have uh, thoroughly recommended that book. So now that you've mentioned it, Linda, um, that would uh, probably add to that as well. Um, yeah, I suppose I sort of feel like I need a bit of a context about what the purpose of this meeting is, but that can come later on. Um, in terms of the sorts of things you're talking about, an interesting thing that's just happening in Australia, we've just come out of uh, two days of extreme heat in Eastern Australia and flooding in Western Australia right at the same time. So we've got, you know, bushfires and houses being burned down and what have you. And the way it's playing out is the day before this heat wave came through Eastern Australia, we had uh, our one of uh, senior members of the government walk into our parliament house with a lump of coal and, uh, you know, use it as a theatrical sort of piece around, um, you know, saying that we need to not be scared of coal and get into, you know, using it as an essential part of our economy. And, of course, in the next two days, uh, we've just had this massive uh, heat wave. So... At one level, you could sort of laugh about it. It's just the ridiculousness of it. But uh, it it's also shows this just great divide between what you've just been expressing, Linda, around this uh, inability to have conversations with people with diverse points of views in the, in the same space. Um, so we've got images, you know, where we've got this massive heat map of Australia, you know, which is going off the record charts with our politicians feeding coal into the furnace to, to keep it all going, <laughs> uh, which makes a lot of sense to people who understand how that works. But, of course, if you, if you come from a different worldview, for whatever reason, um, you know, that, that's a complete disconnect. So we just have to be able to find ways to be able to have civil conversations with each other. And um, one of our TV shows on our uh, national media last night was a, it's called Q&A, which is sort of like a, a theatrical um, reality TV show where, you know, there's a sort of a, ha a handful of panellists with diverse political and social perspectives moderated by, you know, a senior sort of journalist. But then you have um, a live audience who, who are already framed up to ask really contemporary questions, which are quite good. And so it just becomes this massive theatrical sort of ding dong match. And, um, you know, I mean, and then there's a live Twitter feed to, uh, you know, keep the sort of audience across Australia engaged with it. But it is, it is probably one of the, the closest avenues to trying to have a conversation between people with different perspectives in the same space. But the really interesting thing about last night is we actually had one of the panelists was a, one of our, um, you know, sort of well-off uh, business people who's actually uh, sponsored an organisation called the New Democracy Foundation. And he's trying to advocate for, um, you know, different ways of us having civil discourse uh, to solve these intractable problems. So every now and again, you know, in amongst the sort of theatrical exchanges between people of different political persuasions, the moderator asked him, well, how would you deal with this? And, you know, he, um, he did quite well, but you could tell from the way the moderator was, was dealing with it that the ideas that he's trying to bring into the conversation, even though he was trying to be sort of succinct and direct and, and simple in explaining it, uh, you know, he, the moderator, you could tell he was feeling like it was challenging for an audience to understand, you know, the ideas of sortition or randomly selecting people to go onto a citizen's jury. And, mm. 
but one of the metaphors he ended up using that really stuck during the evening was um, he said, you know, our political discourse is like having a bag full of cats. And, uh, you know, we think that if we just get a wise cat and we put it in the bag, it'll, uh, you know, it'll all sort itself out. You know, the wise cat will sort of... And uh, everyone sort of laughed and they just knew that when you put another cat, no matter how wise it is, into a bag full of cats, you just get a cat fight uh, even more so. So um, it, it, that was a nice uh, sort of trying to understand that you actually need to change the bag and, um, you know, ha have some other processes. So yeah, I found that interesting. And um, actually, maybe just to, on another thing, I live in a, a smaller jurisdiction in Australia. It's called the Australian Capital Territory which is sort of like a local government, you know, that sort of looks after, you know, dog licenses and, you know, watering the, the ovals and stuff like that, as well as uh, energy policy and food policy for a community. So it works at a state government level as well as a local government level. And we've just had an election last year. And one of the groups that I'm a part of is set ourselves a task to um, give each newly elected member of the of this assembly there's 25 of them and most of them are women although there's quite a few men um a gift pack of participatory democracy uh tools so we're, we're actually having meetings with them and we haven't met uh probably we've probably only met about half a dozen of them so far but we found these conversations to be really quite engaging by listening to their needs but they I feel like there's a readiness for them to um, experiment with participatory democracy processes or dialogic processes. So we're just trying to sort of keep playing in that space to discover a, a project. And, and one of them is that um, we've got a Greens, um, I won't go into the, 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 the detail of all our politics, but there's a, a minority party called the Greens who've uh, partnered with up up with our more um, left orientated party to be a coalition government. And uh, he's been successful over several um, uh, rounds of elections and he's now the, the climate change minister. So we have a minister for climate change and he is saying, and he said to us, like we recognize we have to start with a, a clean sheet of paper to engage the community which I just thought was a wonderful, um, you know, when most politicians say that, they already have a whole lot of things that want to go onto their clean sheet of paper pretty quick before anyone else gets in there. So, uh, but he recognises that, um, you know, we need processes that engage people and, and it's not predetermined beforehand. And that's mainly played out in the way we do our urban design and building development. You know, the, the people who are into... Uh, the money side of town comes in through building development and the communities see themselves getting enrolled by what happens there and are very disgruntled about that. So that's a hot area for more participatory approaches as well. But the first, um, in terms of this climate change, we already feel like, feel like, feel like can we, in our community that we can get 100% renewable energy to drive our electricity system by 2020. So we, our city is going to be a world leader in that space because we're mainly not an industrial uh, economy. So we've already um, done an innovative process in reverse auctions to get 20-year contracts for supplying electricity from solar voltaic systems and uh, wind turbines uh, you know, around our uh, region. Mark, for some reason, um, I think it might be your uh, headphone or something. It's very, it's just coming in really crackly. I'll, I'll, I'll just hang up and dial again. Hang on, I'll, I'll come back in. Okay. Yeah, I think it might be his uh, connection. I'm not sure. And I don't, I'm going to take the time while he's doing that to make a quick call to Rick because he's right on. Um, email but he's not coming on so I'm not sure there's some there's some disconnect here maybe I can grab him yeah is this that. any better now much yeah. better yeah go go ahead yeah. Could Mark actually I'm just what he said about clean, your clean electricity goal because that's what okay. he was up. repeat that 
Well, just let me check. How, how am I going? This is my first time in this group. I'm just wondering whether I'm sort of taking up too much time no, and whether I need... this is fine. And I'm, I apologize, um, Mark. I always meant to have a conversation with you to kind of orient you. But we're trying simply to have a smaller, more committed group um, that's focused on climate change. And I had remembered uh, your wonderful contribution in our social trans group. And of course, we were with uh, Tom Atlee's group. So invited you in and I'd sent you some things. We never really talked. So we're doing long check-ins and then we're just trying to sort for a question that we might, you know, engage on around climate change. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, if we're all on climate change, uh, I'm on the right track then. Absolutely. So, um, so this is, uh, yeah, our uh, territory is, has set a target to have 100% renewable energy by 2020. And, and really, we're ahead of schedule in doing that. So that's a really exciting thing to be part of a community that's uh, making that happen. Now, we, we live in a nation that is going backwards the other way. So we're, in a way, we've uh, got a lot of chance to be uh, innovators in setting some uh, ways that others can see that this is possible because our mainstream politicians keep on framing this conversation as if uh, it can't be done and we have to revert to old technology and old ways of doing it. And of course, old power and old establishment to, to control all of that. That's the behind the scenes stuff. So part of the process for this um, a clean sheet approach is that by 2050, we want to have a zero net, a zero emissions uh, community. So, so that the next challenge is our transport system and, and, you know, a few other things, but, uh, the, the, the government department that's looking after this is starting a participative process, which uh, I'm going to in uh, two weeks' time. And what I'm noticing, I have to watch out that even though I'm an advocate for this, that I want to behave in a way that isn't adversarial. Of course, that's the sort of dynamic that happens in, in these forums where everyone's trying to um, argue for their point of view. So I think I'm more interested in, in um, advocating for a process that's really inclusive and inclusive of people who aren't skilled practitioners in this space, so not the partisan conversation, but, but ran, you know, like the idea of disinterested citizens participating, but in a legitimate way through a, you know, other processes that are participatory. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how... Um, you know, I, I can articulate that point of view because the the focus may be just get, be getting on transactional ideas to drive our whole economy to be a zero net emitter by 2050. So I want to be able to hold conversations where all of that's valued, but I can sort of differentiate these different ways of uh, the meta level observation of how we work together might actually be more powerful culturally than actually the content of what we're trying to do. So that's probably for me as a facilitator, and I won't be operating as a facilitator. Um, I'll be operating as a participant, but I, but I want to uh, be part of a conversation that creates the container for being aware of how to hold a process for all of this to, to go well and, to, and for it to be adaptive and iterative so we can reflect on our practice as a community and as facilitators. Um, look, you know, maybe I could go into more stuff in all of that, but that's probably where I'm up to at the moment. Um, so it's nice to be listened to. So thank you for listening. Well, hi, everybody. Hi, Rick. Uh, Mark, nice to see your face, everybody. Terrific. Love hearing what you had to say, and I'll uh, give Rick a chance to breathe a little bit. So I'll pick up the, the uh, checking in here. As I said, identifying with each of you and what you had to say. Um, Jim, I definitely want to connect you up with the faith leadership that I'm part of with UU here in the state of Florida. And um, Marty, I really appreciated your talking about the uh, Citizens Climate Lobby being a transactional because that's where, for me, I'm realizing the work I do is moving from transaction to transformation. Uh, however, there's a place for it. 
and some of you have seen this. This was in our paper. Uh, George Schultz and, and James Baker uh, basically are describing the CCL platform, although I pointed out they're calling it a tax instead of a fee. And here in Florida, with our Florida CCL team, we love it because we're, nobody's talking about CCL. They're shining the light on these Republican leaders of the old establishment to say, what a smart idea. So riding the ways that are working, you know? So, so that's one. And then uh, for me this year, we, last year our focus was on solar and voter turnout. This year, our focus is on water. This is for a Florida water ethic. And I've been working with the woman who wrote this at the Collins Center in uh, Tallahassee. Her name is Cynthia Barnett, speaking of books. Highly recommend her books, Blue Revolution. She just got an award on her book called Rain, which she calls her secretive uh, climate change book. So strategically, as you know, that's one of my favorite words. I'm working with the Florida Council of Churches to convene leaders of the faith traditions around Florida with the advocate leaders. And that's next week. We have a three-day assembly that I've been organizing called uh, Floridan, which is the name of our aquifer. Water is our life. And um, our outcomes desired outcomes are furthering a Florida water ethic and the Earth Charter, nurturing bioregional collaborations, Florida legislator contributions, Earth Day opportunities, and ongoing work with what you all have introduced me to, Kiko Chat, the Florida Climate Action Network. So in this three days, we're going to take some deep dives into the Everglades, the Sable Trail, project, which is our version of Standing Rock, water quality, fracking, legislative directions, and how you deal with uh, climate instability in vulnerable areas. And then finally, well, sea level rise, and then working with our University of Florida land grant program, the Institute for Food and Agriculture called IFAS, the head of the program called Sustainable Floridian. So those are some of our speakers. And one of the fun things we're doing on the first night is bringing together stories of Florida Earth from an anthropologist, from the Miccosukee, from the Seminole leaders, some of them involved with the Everglades, the Sable Trail, telling stories around a campfire. So anyway, that's what I'm doing next week. And then the following week, we're bringing that story closer to home to Pinellas County with the woman I mentioned, Cynthia Barnett. She's going to be here to continue the dialogue about the precious waters of Pinellas County. So again, we're on this same theme of, of protecting our waters. And that's where, when you talk about how to bring in people who maybe not have your same point of view, finding something that, that you share in common, which is our water. Okay. So uh, let's see what else can I tell you. That's, that's the main thing because it's so hot on my radar, confirming with each of our speakers what they're going to be doing. But we're setting it up like we have for the last year for this whole peninsula of Florida to be thought of as a place for imaginal cells to come together and find each other. This year, we're gonna be accentuating even more strongly the bioregional efforts. And we have a number of estuaries and rivers and the river keepers are coming to be part of this too. So our outcome from last year has been strengthened tremendously by this tool of Kiko Chat. And then a new one I've come across, and I want to be sure you pick up on it, Marty, is uh, ex-pollinators. Did I send you info about that? Well, now I'm helping organize San Francisco Bay. Oh. 
Yeah. I just can't help myself. You know, I'm a networker and I hear opportunities and I don't have to do anything except y'all need to talk. Yeah. And Crystal, Crystal uh, Huang has created the X pollinators. She's in Oakland. And she's been focusing on Tampa Bay and what we're doing. And she's created a just remarkable platform. So I keep looking for platforms, folks. If I were to summarize, maybe since we last were together, I'm still on the same course. If it's not a project, it's cultivating a field of collective intelligence. And every person, as I'm hearing each of you uh, funnel through your course of action, courses, trails, finding the place where you find you're making your best contribution and feel the most authentic and brings the greatest satisfaction and sense of contribution in my view, that raises the human vibration, the energy field of everybody. And back to Alan Watkins, Jim, uh, when, it, when Alan and I first got together, I was doing the research around the Institute of Heart Math and Fields. And so I'm still in that piece of what Alan talks about is cultivating the coherence of the field. And quite frankly, the projects and the leaders and everything takes care of themselves. That's been my experience in Tampa Bay for 20 years. It's really hard because we're so into transaction instead of cultivating the field. Uh, the other book, I'm not reading it, but I'm finished with it. Um, I'll have to go over there and pull it up, just a minute. While she's doing that, by the way, I, I'm taking a few notes, but um, feel free to add. Oh, okay. feel free to add. And uh, Michelle Holiday, she's up in I think Toronto. Do you know this book? No. It's terrific. She talks about systems and fields. You know, I can't help but think in systems. So I think I call this a primer. Mm -hmm. Michelle, you know, sometimes I get too far down in the weeds. People don't need that. Michelle, she's got it right on top, all you need to know. And Michelle is part of the New England Collaborative, Jim. Do you know about the collaborative up there, that up in New England? What I've, you know, been networking with these different groups. There's a, there's a cluster up in New England. There's a cluster in San Francisco Bay. North, South, East, West, I've learned. They're not together yet. Uh, and then um, Salish or Salish Sea that goes up from Seattle up into Canada. And now they brought in Tampa Bay and Florida. So we're learning in these networks, you know, which is what I think it's about. I think that's enough. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Sandra. That's great. Uh, the ex pollinators, could you just say a little bit more? I, I didn't quite understand. Is it a digital platform? It's a platform for connection. Uh, the, the letter X, pollinators. Mm -hmm. I'm probably spelling it wrong. P-O-L-L-I-N-A-T-O-R-S dot com. Okay. I'm sure Crystal will be delighted to connect with you. We've been doing all kinds of web weaving, you know, with Pachamama. Uh, the other group is the uh, Thriving Resilient Communities Collaborative. Mm -hmm. wow. You heard of them? No. Thriving, say it again. Thriving. Thriving Resilient Communities Collaborative. And Ben Roberts is the facilitator. You all remember Ben. I think he's up in Newtown. Oh, yeah. Cool. And that's also a digital platform? No, no, that's a network. It's a network, okay. That's a, again, I, I find myself more comfortable in networks, networking with networks. And of course, the other big piece that we found successful is having the whole system in the room. 
if you were to go to our website, the Connection Partners, you can see we model the way we engage based on the permaculture flower. It's helpful to have infrastructure. So we find the petals of the, infra of the permaculture helps people uh, organize a little bit. So yes, we're looking at platforms. That's a big piece I'm on constantly. So that's a new one I wanted you all to know about. Great. Thanks, Sharon Joy. So we've all checked in, uh, Rick. All right. Well, hello, everyone. I'm, I'm sorry I'm late. I, uh, I just completely blanked on the hour. I was thinking we started at 6 o'clock Eastern. No, we started at 5 o'clock Eastern. Um, so I, I apologize for being so late. I meant to be here on time. Um, it's snowing here finally in the Northeast, which is wonderful. It's good for the garden, good for the trees. Last summer we had no peaches because we didn't have a proper winter. Um, this summer, maybe this year, we'll have peaches. I live in an area that's, you know, you think of Georgia and peaches, but actually we grow a lot of peaches here in Massachusetts too. Anyway, um, so I'm glad of the snow. Uh, working with Elders Climate Action on, uh, on, we just got a grant, which is going to help us do our outreach efforts to elders. We've been clarifying our, our engagement strategy. Um, most of the age, the uh, groups here in, in, in New England, you know, they don't, the, outside of those that are based in colleges and universities, they don't necessarily have a, um, an age-related recruitment strategy, which is fine, nor, sh nor should they. Um, but that also means that uh, we think that there's a, a great group of elder activists who are in effect missed. Um, and so that's the group we're trying to pull in. And so we're continuing to work on that. Um, and there'll be, there'll be more on that. We're working, we're focused mainly on the state level legislative campaign and our, our, our legislative year is just beginning. In Massachusetts, you may know we have a we have a, a state law that was passed about eight years ago called the Global Warming Solutions Act, which mandates reductions in the state at various points, 2020, 2030, 2040, and so on. And they're significant. And um, fortunately, our great uh, Attorney General, Maura Healey, was watching our Republican administration in terms of the degree to which they were really fulfilling the, the terms of the Global Warming Solutions Act in a way that would get us to the to the goal of 2020. And it was like, well, not so much. Some things they were doing fine, some things they weren't. They went to court over it and they sort of said, you know, this is the law of the state. You've got to meet this. Where's your plan? And so they're working harder on that right now. So, I mean, in some ways, you know, Massachusetts, like California, like some other states, has to... Um, swim upstream on its own. But then I continue to think that the best way to make change happen from a climate point of view in this country, or maybe change in anything at this time, is by working at the state level. Because even under the previous administration and the one before that, trying to work in Washington for a federal level change is very difficult. Now that's not to say I'm not worried about the EPA, I'm very worried about the EPA um, and other things happening at the national level. But that's where our that's what we're working on, recruiting elders locally, focusing on local legislative action. Um, that continues. The only other sort of side sidebar um, is, you know, with uh, here, there are multiple indivisible groups popping up, groups based on the indivisible guide. And I've been contacted by one of them already and maybe a second one this week basically in the sense that they're going, okay, we've got, I just found out we're going to have 40 people there. We're going to have 50 people there. How do you run a meeting with 40 or 50 people? How do you engage them? What do you do? So uh, I think there's going to be a lot of work out there for people that know something about large group facilitation to help people, not on the issue, but on the, the, the design of an engaging meeting that enable them to use the energy and use the ideas in a productive way. So, um, mm -hmm. see where that goes. 
but that's not necessarily just, I mean, like the local, one of the local indivisible groups here has a, has an environment node, but that's one of like four or five nodes that it's going, that it seems to be developing. So that, that's it for now. I mean, there's a lot happening in Massachusetts. We have a big conference coming up at the beginning of March and then people are beginning to plan to go to Washington at the end of April. So that's it for me. I had a lovely time at the Women's March in Tampa. I looked for you, Sharon Joy, but I didn't see you. Oh, that's funny. How many of you showed up for a Women's March somewhere in your local communities? Cool. Was there anything in Australia, Mark? Yeah, there, there was. Uh, and uh, I was actually down the coast by the beach um, in the forest. So I, I wasn't there, but we had um, lots of cities having women's marches. So that was, uh, yeah, a great sign of support for everything that you're doing in your country. And, um, you know, I think it gave a lot of momentum to uh, this uh, voice that needs to be listened to that's, uh, that's there in the background. Yeah. Uh, we had 30,000 here in the city of St. Petersburg. I think some of these were less than marches than stand in place because people were so jammed into the space. And it was right down the street from where I was. I helped get the word out about it. And then I decided, you know what? That's probably my best or my better contribution. I'm going to sit here and be quiet and know they're doing it. So Rick, I wasn't over in Tampa. I wasn't even in the St. Petersburg March, but I did help facilitate getting the word out. Great. We had um, 10,000 people who showed up in Tucson, which was amazing. We had the mayor uh, come out. I got ringside seats both at the beginning of the march and at the end. And I was really um, moved um, just by the raw energy of it uh, for Tucson. I mean, Tucson is a, a more of a liberal place than Phoenix, but it was amazing the energy that came out. Uh, I just hope that we can maintain it, you know. Um, yeah. can, I, can I just pop in a little bit on that? Because this book that I was talking about, This is an Uprising, talks a lot about trigger events. Um, that that either spark a whirlwind, which is what is happening now in reaction to Trump. Trump getting elected was a trigger event. We are in a whirlwind now in the sense that organically people are showing up and the spontaneity and level of engagement of people paying attention is just incredible. And there's a lot of creativity and chaos that's just kind of all pointed on this. Um, but the, and so the book talks a lot about strategies for what is the opportunity of this time, both for our specific issue, which is climate change, but if you have a progressive vision of society, you know, you're talking about a larger vision and movement of people. And, you know, the challenge really is to how do you use the whirlwind to make most, more and more people engaged, and then how do you find ways to link them to the structure-based organizing that sustains action. Right. Um, so it, it, the book's very interesting for stimulating thinking among this, this time we're in. And I think Indivisible was just an incredible force for good in this wave of the whirlwind because it brought in ways for small groups to structure and organize themselves for more sustained action in the middle of this whirlwind. This could be a real breakthrough for movement organizing. We'll have to wait and see. But I mean, it, it potentially shows, it, it's potentially a very positive um, move to help us not have dissipation, which mm -hmm. is somewhat inevitable. There's going to be a decline at some point, unless the clown just persists. I mean, the clown might persist for four years, and then we will all, we'll have a whirlwind for four years. We'll be extraordinarily tired. <laughs> <laughs> I am worried. I am worried about not having an infrastructure to work with. I, I don't know how the rest of you feel, but I, it's hard for me to get terribly excited about supporting the Democratic Party anymore. So I heard a interview with this man. Uh, I think his name is Nick Banos. He was Bernie Sanders' um, 
you know, uh, uh, electoral coordinator, you know, campaign coordinator, I guess it is. And he has just started a, a new party that he would like to see Bernie run on called the People's Party. I don't know. I mean, but then someone said to me today, well, why not just use the Green Party? Like, why start a whole other party? So I'd be kind of curious how you all are feeling about that aspect, because clearly we need some kind of infrastructure if we're going to, you know, move forward and a strategy. And that's where I see us being very weak. Well, for, for me, I mean, obviously I have a lot of empathy for the Green Party, but we don't have everything that I've ever read and, and, and heard. I mean, our ability to manage a third, a, a three or four party system in this country, the way we set up is, it's just not there. And if we wanted to do that sort of like outside of the Democratic Party, we're going to shoot ourselves in the foot first. And if we're willing to put up with 10 years of shooting ourselves in the foot until we can deal with redistricting and get some representatives, you know, it really, really, really take the long view. But boy, um, you know, as somebody said, in the long view, we'll all be dead. I don't, I don't know that that's a, that's a strategy. So I, I think I think the Democratic Party really has to change. I hope it really changes. And usually the best way to change something is from the inside, if it's at all possible. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah. Well, I want to recommend a DVD that one of my collaborators sent to me called uh, We the People 2.0. I've heard about that. Yeah. And the first half or three quarters of it is pretty much stuff we know regarding the environment and we got to do something about it. But then it gets into, oh my gosh, what are you saying? And uh, fortunately, I watched it with someone else on Friday night and I said, maybe it's because it's Friday night and I'm worn out from the week. But I don't think I can digest this. I'm going to have to listen to it again. But it really points out the federal government isn't going to do this. And you go down to the state's rights. And these are some attorneys talking about how the state's rights isn't going to do this. And if I've heard correctly, if you keep rolling it down, we've got to look at the Constitution and the articles of... Uh, Oh, gosh, whatever the, the, the next phase of it was, um, not the Articles of the Confederation. But the, um, the premise that the people wrote these documents on is another world, another set of worldviews, including the fact that, you know, these are, these are wealthy landed men. And uh, number two, they... Um, don't believe in women having power, and certainly slaves aren't even human. Martha, I have to call you back. I'll call you back in just a few minutes. So anyway, I think it's definitely worth learning about and maybe watching because it gives you some real serious things to look at back to what you're saying about the the different parties i have a young friend who's running for the city council of st petersburg 27 years old and he's been counseled by two on the council that he's crazy not to take the support of the democratic party he said i'm not going to do it i have to stand up and do it this way and if i lose i lose i'm not going to collude Go ahead, Marty. Marty, you're on mute. Okay, I'm unmuted. Now let me see if I can collect myself. You know, I mentioned before in my introduction that I'm still kind of having this walk in the wilderness about um, some of the work I'm doing and I'm and at what level I want to be engaged at and. Um, I just let me just take a moment to see if I can pull this back in. I think in listening to all of you talk about the work trying to um, cross the divide and get legitimate conversations between people who right now are in bubbles and aren't speaking to themselves and the great, you know, conservative liberal divide, for lack of a better word, there's many labels we could put on it. But the struggle that I have with being drawn to that, and I certainly have skills I could apply in that arena 
and I do some of that through Citizens Climate Lobby. I mean, that's what that's a lot of what we do. But the reason that I'm kind of having a pushback from it is the is this larger political question of really how do we get good things happening again that need to happen for our planet, for our species, and for our world. And the whole it I think globally it's happened. Certainly in the states, we've had this incredible shift to the left. So the center now is very right, mm -hmm. relatively speaking. So to me, part of what I think about is how do we, and, and this book that I'm reading, This is an Uprising, goes into it some too, but it's got me thinking of it more about how do we, how do we reshift the conversation to more where the center is really in the center and back towards a more progressive understanding of things. I mean, I don't know that I'm making sense at all, but um, you don't do that by sitting down with conservatives and saying, I've got a deal for you on a great carbon tax. Because all the given assumptions of the worldview and of the way the world works are tacit. And, and so it keeps kind of the frame still in a very narrow conservative frame. So when I, that's why I'm thinking of getting more involved in movement organizing, because there you have a chance to try to shift the culture a little bit. This is really a cultural approach, not a, a political approach. If you're trying to reach people and have them say, I want renewable energy because it's healthy and it's good for me, rather than my family can barely get by and I'm scared to try anything different. I'm not maybe giving the right example, but, um, and I think I'm rambling a little bit. I guess I'd like to ask for some feedback. Did anything I just say make sense? Do people know what I'm trying to get at? Because I think I, I rambled. <laughs> I, I actually do, and I'd I want you to say more because what I'm, let's see, what I'm noticing with my, um, my two dialogues that are looking at, you know, trying to understand the divide in more depth is that until we really do understand where, which worldview or how the worldviews are clashing, we can't get to anything else. So I, I was very frustrated in this last dialogue on Wednesday because with help uh, from Scott and the one conservative we've attracted in the dialogue, um, I'd had a little pre-conversation the weekend before, we came up with just trying to unpack the term empathy and compassion from a conservative point of view and a liberal point of view. I, I had no idea that even those words were such trigger words for both sides. And I didn't realize why. Now I have a little bit more insight, and it, it's giving me great appreciation for how the conversation, if you get at too much of a specific issue, it takes you away from the, where the underlying disconnect really is. So I think that's what you're trying to get at, if I'm hearing you right. Well, I mean, I can, my best example would be from, you know, from the past, like from trigger events in the civil rights movement, where, you know, people pretty much accepted separate but equal as just the way the world was. And there wasn't a lot of public outcry among the mainstream or anything to try to change this. You could, maybe people would have discussions and wring their hands a little bit and say, this doesn't really sound all that fair, but this is the way we're organized. And then there were trigger events where, as the civil rights movement built up, where people saw the reaction from the police, they saw the, the violations to people, and it suddenly shifted the whole public perception of what was fair in our country related to African-American people in our society. So that was a shifting of the political center towards more just, more equitable, less racist configurations of our society. So that that's just a, gives you an example of, of what I'm trying to think about in terms of climate and how we rally more support and raise people's awareness that, um, that that we if we if we want you know that if together we can accomplish a lot, but we're going to have to galvanize a lot more people. Or by the time the the powers that be make the changes that they seem to be making, it's just pretty slow. So that's that's kind of what I'm the type of things I'm thinking about. Is how do you move the political center? And also one quote that was in the book was from. Um, Actually, it was from Dave Roberts. Everybody knows Dave Roberts, the blogger on Vox. And he said, you know, if you want to shift the center, you have to pull from one of the ends. 
Hmm. You know, so, so, it, so this is partisan. Do you see what I mean? Those of us that want to stand in the middle and bridge a divide, I, I really value that and I think it's really important. But if you really feel we've got a screwed up center conversation going on in our society, you really have to pull from one of the ends and try to get the public cultural shift toward recalibrated towards a different understanding of what's fair, of what's just, about how we should be acting as citizens. So that's what I'm trying to think about in relation to climate change right now. Uh, I want to be sure you look up uh, thriveeastbay.com with Joshua Gorman. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, have you heard of him? Yes. Okay. Because Crystal is working with them, with the ex-pollinators. And the reason I was particularly drawn, I already know Joshua from Pachamama, but their emphasis is on love. That's pretty much in the middle. Yeah, yeah. But give, give me an example of what you're thinking of in terms of climate change, Barney. Like when you say coming from, pulling from one end into the middle, what like- well, I'll I, give you one example that I think is working that is happening now, it's, it's, it's at risk now of not getting enough media, but when the veterans showed up at Standing Rock, when we had veterans from our, our wars going to Standing Rock and saying, I have to be, you know, we have to apologize to the native people of our society for our past military transgressions. And we have to stand here because they have a just cause to be able to protect their sacred lands and be able to protect their water. Um, that, that has the potential, if it got enough media attention, to really shift a lot of public opinion where people would normally perceive people that are gathering to oppose a pipeline in the middle of nowhere as really marginal behavior. I'm a mainstream citizen. That's marginal behavior for me. I don't even really understand it. They're too extreme. The government already did all the studies and decided what, you know, do you see what I'm saying? It's, it's things like that that have the potential to shift people and bring people along to make connect the dots that this isn't radical wanting to stop these pipelines isn't shouldn't be reserved for kind of the fringe people of our society this is a mainstream concern we should all understand it and embrace it as very mainstream citizens in our society but um but that's a cultural that's a perceptual shift that needs to happen. But I think things like veterans showing up at Standing Rock is a good example with the right publicity and the right exposure to help people make, make those connections. Thanks, that's, so that's a good example. Rick, you want to say something? Rick, you're on mute. Can you start over again, Rick? You're on mute, let me just see. Okay, I just unmuted you. I'm good. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, Start over again. We didn't hear you. Oh, gosh. Put me back on mute. I'll come back. I've got to take this call. Sorry. Oh, all right. Well, thank you, Marty. That was a great example. That, that was what I was searching for. So some sort of public event uh that that suddenly the mainstream press picks up on and it just goes viral that that helps a lot well the woman's march was definitely one of those it was the woman's march reached beyond the the margins into the center more and i think it was a huge positive shift yeah except the thing, the thing it's got paying attention on a different level as I watch these events is what I'm saying, to try to understand and then right. inform how, what I want to cultivate, what I want to support. The only thing that was confusing to me about the Women's March is that it was so multiple issue oriented. It, it, um, in fact, actually it's now getting some backlash. I read in the Times that conservative women are like, well, what are we, chopped liver? You know, in other words, it, um, some of the backlash is that it didn't include um, people who, who felt conservative. In other words, they didn't feel welcome even if it brought in some of the issues that they might support. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I don't know. I'm familiar with that, yeah. Rick, why don't you go ahead? I'll take you off mute here. Okay, you are unmuted. Sorry. 
sorry, sorry to leave you as coming back. I thought that the, uh, the example from Standing Rock was, was very interesting too, especially when the, uh, the, the, you know, the veterans showed up. And in, in various places, I heard people sort of going like, oh, now this is different. So to your point, Marty, it was coming out. I think that the difficulty is that the timing of when it happened, I don't know how many weeks that was or even days, before President Obama just said, right, stop it. But the story wasn't out there long enough. And there were so many other stories with the incoming Trump administration at that time that it was very hard to hear it. Um, it was probably one of the few stories, though, that was picked up strongly for a while as compared to all the ones about the new administration. So it the the essence was there. It may not have lasted long enough, and and for that, I I feel sorry. But I, I think that's that's a great example. I don't know whether there'll be another opportunity like that. I don't think uh, Standing Rock is going to be it, from what I'm hearing now. That even though you know that that case is sort of closed, so to speak. But well, they're going back. The veterans are going back to Standing Rock now. So it would be something to watch and see. They said they were going back for the last stand. Okay, but uh, the other thing I hear is that it's moving so fast there before they know it, they're going to have maybe, the pipeline yeah. completed. Yeah, maybe, it, maybe that's true. Yeah. Um, I heard anyway. some very bad news that states now, because of things like Standing Rock and because uh, they are anticipating incredible outcries of resistance, states, I think I heard up, I don't know how many states, I think like nine or ten states are enacting uh, legislation to make it illegal to protest like they were doing at Standing Rock. So in other words, in fact, I think uh, we're Standing Rock, North Dakota. I think even North Dakota has some bill they're trying to pass right now that will make it $1,500 fine and 30 days in jail if you're protesting. So well, that's it. Um, that's on American. It's it happening now. It's, it's got it's to go to the Supreme Court and we hope that the Supreme Court will be enough strict constitutionists that they'll say, no, 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 you can't do that. Um, but. You know, let me barge in with just one other thing on, on across the divide. I have a brother that voted for Trump and um, I, we finally talked. He said, I was waiting a while until you came out of mourning to talk to you. But, but when I talked to him a couple of days ago, we didn't, I didn't want to get into it with him and I didn't have a long time, but the way that I framed it to him and I've used this in other situations, cause this is what I is in my heart right now is that there's partisan issues on the table that are heartbreaking to me, but those are partisan issues. But I feel that there's a huge nonpartisan issue that's surfacing right now with our current president. And I cite the many examples of his conflicts of interest, of um, his character, just different things. And say that I bring this up not as a progressive person, I bring this up as an American citizen, that, that there's nonpartisan issues that any American should be looking at. And do you feel the same way? And, and we did find a little bit of common ground on that. So um, to me, I felt like I didn't lose any of my integrity um, by having an across the divide conversation that way. And I felt it was really important to make that distinction of, my partisan reaction to what's going on and my nonpartisan reaction as an American citizen to what's going on right now. I like that a lot. It's almost like it rises above, how can we rise above the partisan? Yes, yeah. I would, I, if, if I, I'll just make, I don't think we should take this conversation in this direction, but I, I like that too, Marty. But what it makes me think is, can we also extend that same logic to talk about cabinet appointees and go, what was he thinking when he appointed this person with this level of experience and this background to that post? Was that what you voted for? <laughs> Did you vote for Goldman Sachs? Did you vote for private schools? Did you vote, you know, et cetera? Yeah, it started to go on the slope, I think, but yeah. It's, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm kind of confused as to, well, not really confused. I'm just 
wondering how we can get the conversation back to climate change because no one wants to talk about climate change anymore. It's not even an issue now that Trump has gotten into office. The only issue is getting him out of office. And of course, we're losing all this time. So it's just very interesting to me. And I, you know, I, I've, myself, I've just lost interest. <laughs> so I understand. Well, I, I would say that here, the, the conversation, most of the conversations I'm in with the climate groups, are, we really are pretty much just talking about what do we need to do on the climate change. As bad as it is, what can we do? Now, maybe I'm lucky because I live in Massachusetts, so there's a glimmer, there's, there, there's some issues, there's some slippage, but I mean, you know, it's, there's, there's work to be done that's, that's, that's close at hand, mm -hmm. and so that helps. I suppose at a community level, at a city level, at a town level, that could also be true. I just went to a great fair that's sponsored by uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, the, you know, the Cooler Smarter book that came out a couple of years ago. That concept, if you go to coolersmarter.org, you'll see it. You'll see basically the whole concept of this fair. It was run in, in a town near me. Whose, town, whose name you know, Concord. And, and the whole thing was, how can we take, make Concord 20% greener, 20% cooler this year right. through the actions of individual citizens? And then there were like 20 different exhibits throughout right. this fair. What can you do about the way you manage your yard? What can you do um, for changing the way you heat your water, changing your, you know, you know, all of the other things that you'd think of, but all in one place. And every time you went to a booth, you talked to someone, you had, a, you had a sheet you could fill out and you could begin to see, well, yeah, I could do that. I could take one meal of meat away from my family. We could switch to, to vegetables only one meal a week, you know, and what's that worth? And they, they, had, they had it all worked into their little calculator and you'd see this big screen with the with the whole town's reported results beginning to change the way the curve on that on that screen so i you know I'd be interested to see in six months what that's done for that town's it was already a pretty forward-looking town in terms of the environment anyways but um this came down to a lot more of the individual actions and uh it's good yeah and again i, I rec i'm i'm trying to get people in groups I work with just buy a copy of the book and read it for themselves. And the book is Cooler Smarter? Cooler Smarter. Cool. That's great. That's very and I want to give you all what I think and others agree are the uh, best resources for access about climate, or excuse me, more about sea level rise for us. It's called Climate Central. Mm -hmm. And you can go in there. I may have talked about that when we were last together, but others keep confirming this is the best place. Uh, you can go in there and show, it'll show you what the sea level rise is projected to be, what the economic impact is, what the impact on the poor community is on those zip codes. It's very good and they collaborate with many sources. Highly regarded group of uh, people from Princeton that left the university to create Climate Central. Is this a website or a yeah. book? A website, yeah. So okay. climatecentral.com or something like that? I think it's .com and their, uh, their piece called Risk Taker, I think is on there and that's where you can get this assessment. Now, what's the other thing I wanted to tell you all? Uh, oh yeah, now we've got uh, General Mattis on, uh, Department of Defense, and we've got uh, Tillerson, and even though we may think of them as more of the of the dark side, uh, the Navy and the Army and all of the military already know about climate change and have their plans in place. So talk about change from the inside. So do the, um, the oil companies. If, if Rex Tillerson is at that level of CEO, he's like being head of Philip Morris. We already know what the details are. Now, what they do with that information with Trump, we may have some influence on. I don't know, but I'm right back with you, Rick. It has to be where you can have influence. You can feel you're doing something 
that's making a difference in your community, whether it's, uh, like you said, cutting out meat once a week or whatever. So the other one that's an excellent resource is Green America, greenamerica.org. Lots of incredible uh, how to be a green business is on there. They have a whole certification process. But doing it locally is where the leverage comes. That's what changes the coherence. I'm actually kind of curious, Jim, since you're so active in your church community, are you finding that to be so like people, like you're, you've been at this for two years, are people in your church community taking, you know, individual, more individual action because of your group? Or are you more focused on bigger issues? I'm just kind of curious what your work in that community has been like. And you're on mute. I'm here. I'll unmute you. Am I on? Now sure. you're on. Maybe. Okay. So uh, we've had a green, green sanctuary uh, effort, and it's part of a, the national uh, Unitarian effort. And uh, we publish uh, tips every every week, every month, uh, you know, every week about things you can do personally. Uh, we uh, have uh, we had a major showing of cowspiracy, and we turned a lot of people into vegetarians. Uh, it, it's a wonderful uh, video, and uh, so I would say that uh, we're pretty good in the the personal uh, practices, including myself, who got. Anderson renewal windows um, that block everything out, including uh, the particular lights that plants like. Come on. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah, I know. So that's what we're doing. And, and back to your infrastructure. So I, I'm then within an organization that has his mission of uh, social change and protests. And so I have that, uh, you know, kind of body of people I can work with. And I don't, it doesn't sound like you do, Linda. Are you able to go out, or is your group doing things in the, uh, in your local community to- Yeah, we are. Uh, we do a lot of protesting right at the town hall and extra. Have you ever heard of this uh, rising together? The what? Coming out of your, uh, let's see. It's called rising together. Rising together. This is it. Yeah. And the website is www.reacttoolkit.net. And it's from the, uh, funded in part by the Universalist Fund for Social Responsibility, Yeah, put together by Jan Boer in Boca Raton. So it's a React Toolkit. Can you say that name again? I'm sorry, I, I had to put these, uh, uh, this headphone on. So www, what was it? React, oh shoot, lost it. React toolkit.net so that's a website mm -hmm. okay I, I lost it here so I'm gonna see if I can bring it back all right Here's anyway up. it's a UU project started it as part of your green sanctuary okay from Jan Boer in uh, Boca Raton. She now lives in uh, Orlando. She's going to be doing a presentation at our thing next week. Great. But it, it's a wonderful thing around, particularly around the vulnerable communities that are going to be in fact that are being affected by climate. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, um there's some, kind of, there's, there's some strange noise in the background. But, um, the, uh, now I've forgotten what I was going to say. Uh, shoot. <laughs> I got distracted by the noise. Um, 
aging. <laughs> it'll come, it'll come around again. Go ahead, uh, it'll come back. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's probably this uh, microphone I was putting in. I'll, I'll try not to use it. People are gonna start to come into the classroom, so I may have to put this in again. So anyways, that's probably what caused that. I know, I know. This is a comment back to Jim. So some of the stuff that we're beginning to push on here in terms of individual action, um, goes deeper. Um, there were, there's somebody here in our network, a guy named Arnie Epstein, who wrote a, a paper, basically a policy paper. He's a MIT engineer type. It's called Get Real. And basically what he does is he tracks out to 2050 and he sort of says, so if we're going to get to not zero emissions by 2050, he doesn't believe it's technically or economically feasible, but say 80%. What does that mean for things like the infrastructure of your house? Your house is probably, the house that you live in now is probably still going to be standing in 2050. How many furnaces, you know, in the Northeast we worry about furnaces, how many, how many you know, heating systems will have been replaced between now and 2050? One, two? What are the steps you're making? So we're already beginning to think about, so our heating system, and our air conditioning is 20 years old, which means that the efficiency is going and the air condition, what are we gonna replace it with so that it's the next step for the next 20 years? So, um, you know, will we go to a heat pump? Will we go to geothermal? So, you know, it's very interesting when you get that frame and you start looking harder at how you live. I just bought a electric car, very excited about that. Um, you know, I was, and I got it for, you know, in, in New England, I got it for a total with $18,000 of incentives. So I bought a Chevy Volt for nice. about the same thing as I would have bought like a, you know, you name it, an eighteen dollars or $20,000 sedan of any make, but it's, it's electric hybrid. Um, and it's great. So, you know, you keep looking at these, what can I do to advance this? What kind of... What's the next generation of technology in this house? Well, one of the things that's happening at the legislative level in this state is there was, there's uh, been a bill, it hasn't has yet to be passed, that would put a kind of a green certification on houses when they sell. Not unlike the Energy Star rating on an appliance, now you're getting an Energy Star rating on the house so that if you turn, if, if this goes through, so let's say I invest in something and I sell the house in five years. I didn't get to get the economic benefit, the payback, because I wasn't here long enough. But I might get it in the resale house. Meanwhile, it begins to push in the other direction and making, making more houses greener uh, by plan and by design. So that's pretty interesting. You know, those kind of things are pretty cool. I'd like to say something and then I'm going to have to move myself to another room because people are beginning to come in. But this is this relates to our group here in 2030 okay. architecture. The one thing I'm learning, we had an energy um, consultant come down to this group in Tubac uh, who addressed them last week. This is something called a, um, what is it, Alliance for Action. It's a, uh, they're using the indivisible guide and people are making phone calls like crazy. But this energy consultant got up and talked for about an hour and exactly what you said rick and what this conversation is kind of moving towards it's people beginning to install things in their homes in their buildings to cut down or to, to improve their efficiency suddenly everybody starts doing it because everybody's talking about it so it's that um you know in, in psychology of course it's that mirroring effect so i do think there's something here we're, we're getting on that it's, it's practical it's something you can do right now you don't have to wait for anybody to tell you know to legislate it. I'd be nice if the legislature and the state actually recognized it in the way you're saying, Rick. But of course, in Tucson, that's not going to happen. <laughs> My teacher has just walked in. <laughs> but um, but I, I like I like that a lot. So I'm going to move in, on. In NPR this week on on evening uh, on uh, all things considered is running a series on electric cars. There you go. I didn't, you didn't hear my check-in, Rick, but I'm putting solar on my rooftop at home and I'm gonna buy an electric car because Rick. I'm just frustrated with it. You know, I'm not, nothing else in my life is working, but I can do those things, you know? <laughs>
Okay, I'm moving. I'm moving my show. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 And I'm sorry, but I know I need to check out myself. I've got. I have to check out too. I've got some people waiting. Yeah, here. I think it'd be a good time. Oh, okay. So I'm. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I don't. I don't mean to make us check out because of me. I can actually come over here and sit in another place, but I did have to kind of leave where I was. So I'm going to find a couple of those websites I mentioned. I'm sorry, but my computer froze while I was looking for it, or I would have just put them on our link there. So I will get back to you. Wonderful to see your faces, hear what you're doing. Uh, you're inspiring. Bye-bye. So, so Sharon, hey. Sharon Joy, before you go, or before we all go, uh, there is a page of notes. I would encourage any of you to fill it in because I just, I did the best I could to take some notes down. But uh, yeah, all right. Thank you. So shall we all take off? Uh, do we yeah. want to just make sure that we're on for next time? Uh, is Mondays, is this going to work for us? I think this is what we're trying for, yeah. Okay, so a month from today, I'll try to get it up on the site and I'll get the, uh, the recorded Zoom video up on, on the site as well. Well, wonderful to see you all. And I think this format's working, right? I don't think we need to do much. All right, bye take bye. care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, Rick. Bye, bye-bye. Bye, Rick. bye. bye, -bye. bye.